Thank you, Janice. <laughs> Okay, uh, this presentation is being sponsored by the Danby Conservation Advisory Council, otherwise known as CAC. And it's the first um, of an agricultural education series, which is offering three presentations over several months. And it is entitled Introduction, Local Partners and Common Misperceptions. And I encourage you, this is a regular Zoom. We, um, uh, at the time we made this, we were just shifting to a new web page, web uh, site, and the town clerk couldn't make a, a webinar. So I encourage people when we start speaking to shift from gallery view to uh, speaker view anytime. Um, New York State, as you may know, has a wealth of institutions and organizations that are partners to support farming. And we're going to hear about some of them here. Um, also, how members of the community can help each other and partner. Uh, the speakers are Barb Neal of Tioga Cooperative Extension, Lindsay Wickham of the Farm Bureau, Paul Gear of Tompkins County Soil and Water could not make it. So Barbara is going to fill in for him on some of the things he was going to talk about. Um, local farmers from Danby and Caroline are here in attendance now. Uh, John Whit Whitmore. Hello, John. And uh, Kristen Loria. And I don't is, is um, Steve Wanoski here. Oh, there you are. There you are. Hi. Okay. Um, the other, the second and third presentations are going to be on regenerative, regenerative agriculture. And um, also conserving farmland and transitioning to a new generation of farmers. Um, questions can be entered in the chat and uh, we'll address them at the end, except for John Whitmore, who has to leave early. So when he speaks, we'll let anybody who wants to ask him a question, ask just then and there. Um, this also was partially the results, this presentation is also partially results of the formation of the Danby Ag Working Group a group formed in response to new zoning discussions in Danby that are taking place right now. And I wanna give uh, credit here to Alyssa De Villiers, who was an organiz organizational force for that committee. Um, she is also a sheep farmer, also a farmer, a sheep farmer. She lives on um, Eastman Hill Road. And one of the Ag Working Group's major contributions to was to make the town planner and planning committee realize that value added and light industry are an important part of farming nowadays. And um, in the current draft zoning proposal, because of this, an application for light industry can be attached to a parcel if appealed to the Danby Planning Board. In the draft zoning document, it's on the front page of the Danby website. You can access it through that. Uh, and you and Danby write this down now because it's difficult to find. Section 610 is on this agricultural support, small scale commercial and light industry. It's a floating zone that can go with any parcel. The purpose and intent is to establish an agricultural support for a small scale commercial and light industry and to enable the development of small scale commercial businesses and small scale light industrial 
that directly supports local agricultural production. And um, these businesses are not required be are not required to be located on a farm and may serve multiple farms in the area. And um, the comment from me that this is directly oriented to cooperatives because a single farmer already in an agricultural district has the right to do this on their own property for themselves. So look at that description, section 610, if you're interested in this kind of thing in the draft zoning uh, write-up and get comments back to David West, the planner, please. Um, agriculture in Danby is also allowed in every zone except the Hamlet Center. Agriculture is also protected by the ag districts, which are state and not municipal. And uh, Lindsay is going to address that in his talk. Um, what prompted these presentations was um, what we can all see is that farming is in transition. Um, some would say that farming is in crisis, but it is also to demonstrate how important farming is to our community um, and preserving open space. Things we are trying to do in our town of Danby. Uh, we in the Ag Working Group believe that agriculture and healthy soil is extremely important to encourage and support. And all of us who have I'm a deep love for the land, the soil and the rural lifestyle, whether we are homesteaders, farmers or gardeners, are part of an ongoing struggle to learn to adapt and to be better at what we are doing. So the, this first presentation is a call to be both realistic and idealistic. Um, the first speaker is Barb Neal. She is the agricultural agent and horticultural educator in Tioga Cooperative Extension, but she lives in Danby. And uh, I'll let her tell you more about herself. She is the one who got me to start talking with misperceptions. Go to it, Barb. All right, well, I won't bore you with, um, with more about me. I think, you know, I'm the ag agent uh, for Tioga County, and my background is in horticulture, specifically arboriculture trees. Uh, and so I, when we had a meeting with David West, the planner, um, Betsy and I kind of connected and we talked, to, I, I said, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about farming. And, and Betsy, you, you said it exactly right. There, it's both farming, in New York State is both in peril and also has sort of what I call bright lights of opportunity. And in peril, I would say the the tradition, um, the traditional small family farm in this part of New York has is dairy. And you probably, are, if you're on this call, you know that dairy as a market, uh, small scale family farms is in true peril. The margins are too, uh, too slim for most farms to be profitable. I actually was an econ major in college. And we learned, one of the first things you learn is in every business, um, there are three aspects of having a business. You either have to invest in land, in infrastructure, or labor. So if you think about Google or Facebook, they really don't have much land. They don't have that much. They, they might have like computer infrastructure, but what they put their money in is, is the labor, the, the, the six inches between each of their employees' ears, right? They're paying for brain power. Um, a retail store, they need product, they need inventory, they need um, and a hard uh, store. 
and, and until we start to go online. But in farming, you need land, infrastructure, and labor. So just to start, like as a as a sort of a paradigm for work, you're already a little bit under the gun. And when um, the way the prices are for milk right now, they just don't allow for um, a, a, a decent living, quite frankly, for most of our small dairy farms. And when I say that, Lindsay, jump in here, I would, I would put that in from the 200 cow down, right? There, yes, there are some very large farms. You know, my mom lives near the New Bergen farm in Schuyler County and they have 2000 cows and a robotic milkers. Uh, that, you know, that system, I don't know how profitable they are, but they certainly are growing. <laughs> uh, but the farms in my county, most of them are 200 cows and, and less, um, you know, that are milking and they're having a tough time. Barb, um, let me just interrupt, Barb. You have Calvin Snow uh, labeled iPad right below, you know, <laughs> right below you on my screen, and he can certainly attest to that fact. Okay, dairy farmer. Yep, dairy yeah. farmer. Yeah, go ahead. It, go it's ahead. tough, you know. Um, so, and and those uh, dairy farmers tend to be our sort of model of the full time farmer. Um, there are a lot of other kinds of farmers out there. I actually don't deal, don't work directly with dairy um, farmers. Uh, we have an entire team at Cornell Extension that deal with cow comfort, farm business management, um, crops and all that. So I actually don't deal that much with the dairy folks. I deal with most of the other folks, the uh, livestock, uh, value-added products, agritourism, uh, that kind of thing. And, and those farms uh, can do okay. Uh, it is a business and most businesses, as you know, are not successful, right? Most businesses are out of business in eight years, uh, just across the board. Uh, so it is tough. It's tough to be an entrepreneur. I've been one myself and I, I lasted eight years and then I went off to, I said, oh, I'm not making enough money and I went off to graduate school. So I think one of the misconceptions is that farmers are always full-time farmers. And at least in my experience, almost all the farmers I work with have an off-farm job. They are farming in addition to their work. And so it, it doesn't pay enough for them to stay on the farm. The only um, caveat to that is we have a whole lot of new Amish farmers in our county and a lot of them can stay on the farm, but they have a whole different business model. Um, so full-time farming, uh, except for dairy farming is really hard. You can do it, but it takes sort of an almost an extra layer of being able to market, do direct marketing to, um, to clients, really reaching out, doing agritourism, maximizing the dollars that people are spending at their farm. Um, if you Just because you can grow a crop doesn't mean you can sell a crop. And a lot of our farmers go into farming because they love animals and they love grazing or they love growing vegetables or, or tree fruit. But really, you only the money cuts in your pocket when it's, the product is sold. And so unless you're willing or can partner with somebody who's really good at marketing, it's hard to really make a full-time living um, farming, basically. The other, <laughs> this is sort of an allied misconception, is that it's pretty easy. Well, like, I mean, I have some sheep and then, you know, they, I, I breed them, I get more sheep. Or I have chickens and they, you know, lay eggs. Well, it isn't easy. Uh, I can tell you that I went to a presentation um, in in Pennsylvania. There's paid on-the-job training for different skills. But the first thing you have to do is there's a professional who will write out every skill that is needed to be, you know, to, to produce you know, to be a welder, to be a lineman, you know, or whatever. And the woman who was working 
with um, this organic farming um, organization to create an on the job training booklet of training. She said there were 29 different chapters, as I recall, it was 29 different skills that had to be mastered to do a mixed vegetable production. Not only did you know have to know seed starting, soil work, weed identification, integrated pest management, marketing, scheduling, it went on and on, Re tractor repair, tractor use. So it's really, really complex. And it's never the same each season, right? We had a dry season last year, we had a wet season this year. Um, bugs come in that we never had before and we have to deal with. Um, so there's always a constant uh, change in, in the environment of farming. So it is really a difficult job. And I think people don't give credit to it. They see, you know, smiling face at the Ithaca farmer's market and they think, wow, what a great life. Well, it is a great life, but you're working your butt off and you have to constantly grow and constantly learn to stay ahead of the curve and, and continue to bring dollars in to your farm. Having said that, there's a lot of people who want to get into farming. I get called um, frequently, uh, Barb, I, you know, we want to, I've always loved being outside, tired of my job, I want to be a farmer, and I want to buy land in Tioga County, and I'll help them. And then they call and say, or, or somebody just calls and says, so I'm a new farmer, I just bought some land, where's the money to, you know, start a farm? And I'm always the one that has to break it to them. There is no free money to start a farm. There is no free money. Um, there's this misperception that there are grants all over the place and they are, they are not there. They're just not there. There are grants for what like USDA beginning farmers, but the USDA defines beginning farmer as somebody who's been farming from five to 10 years. There's no money if, if, I, if somebody walked in my door and said, I have 20 acres, I want to farm, where are the grants? Please, if you guys know of any, please let me know because there isn't any that I know of. There are loans. If you're a good business person and could put together you know, a, a decent business plan, you can get loans uh, from a bank. There are Kiva loans, there are loan situations, but you will have to pay them back. And so I think that's a huge misperception because with Lindsay, you probably get the same thing, right? Where, where are the grants at? All the time. Uh, they, there just aren't any. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do at Tyree County is uh, we just bought a farm for our association and we're gonna be having an incubator um, farm program where we will we'll low, um, uh, we will lease out land at a very low cost, like 10 acres or 20 acres for grazing or crop production or regenerative agriculture. And hopefully we'll help provide these people with the first five years of farming experience so they can go out and secure some grants. Um, but they have to, they, you have to start with that first five years. Um, much like uh, it's a little different now, but remember when you would try to find a waiter or waitress job, they're like, well, you need experience before you get hired. And is, and, but you can't get experience unless you're hired, right? It's just kind of the same thing with farming and, and grants. So those are the, the sort of the big three that, um, that most farmers are full-time. Most farmers are not full-time. Even dairy farmers now are having to get off farm jobs, driving bus, you know, doing something, plowing snow um, to make ends meet. Um, it's definitely a misconception that farming is easy. It requires numerous skills, um, both broad and deep in terms from pest identification and planning, seed um, life cycles, cropping, uh, repairing machines, um, the whole thing. And then finally, the biggest one I think is that there is money available to beginning farmers because there really isn't. Now, I, I told this to Betsy and she goes, man, that is all a bummer. Come on, throw me a bone here. And um, there are some bright lights. Um, 
uh, the brightest light of all um, potentially is still a dim light, um, but I think if we could ever swing it, it would be a game changer in New York. And that is payment for ecosystem services. We need to pay our farmers to do the work to improve the land. Right now, for instance, soil and water, at least in Tioga County, I assume in Tompkins, will um, we'll work with farmers to get um, cover crop seed for them to cover their land. And it's vitally important that farmers do that. It Not only does it help their land, it helps flood proof our streams. And I think that that's, that connection has to be echoed from every, every corner of this area. I mean, I, you know, my home town in Tioga is Owego. It's been underwater multiple times because of the Susquehanna flooding. We know how to fix this. We need to cover the land and that the uh, land with higher organic matter is like a sponge for water. So not, it'll drought proof and it also will flood proof the land. But I don't see why we aren't paying farmers to do it. They are, when they do it, they do it for their own um, uh, sense of environmental um, stewardship. And also it's the right thing, a good thing to do for their soil. I think we should be paying, they are providing a service to us when they do it. So if we can ever get that, um, that market fully established, there are, there are fits and starts on that. And if we could get that started, that would that would be a game changer. Barb, let yes. me just interrupt you uh, because our next uh, uh, presentation is going to have Graham Sal Salvo Salvio and Savio, and he Salvia, yeah. is working on exactly that. That's one of the things a group of people from uh, Tompkins County Cooperative Extension is working on paying farmers for. Um, uh, ecosystem services. It's and, a game changer. It, yeah, yeah. It'll be a game changer. And it makes complete sense because the farmers are contributing to the commons and why should they have to pay for it? Exactly. So um, I think that's also in the inter Department of the Interior nowadays. I mean, they're, they're looking at that under the Biden administration. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I think it would be a game changer, especially for... Uh, these small farms. I mean, the, as you say, they are contributing to the common good. They should be paid for it. That's my personal feeling. Um, and it could be a very bright light. Um, it would transform farming here. Um, soil and water, what they do is also a super bright light. Uh, Tioga County um, is very strong soil and water. Uh, Tompkins as well. They work with farms to identify um, areas that could be improved environmentally, and then they go out and find the funding and get that stuff done on the farm. I'm not as familiar with Tompkins, um, the way they work, but with Tioga, if they identify, say, a dairy farmer that could use better manure storage, they go out and they get the funding and that storage system is built and protecting streams. So that we need, again, to amplify the work uh, that our soil and water conservation services do because it, it's really great work. It is kind of behind the scenes work. They do buffer plantings. Um, what Paul uh, was going to talk about at my property, there was a new program through the Upper Susquehanna Coalition to put wetlands on private property. Um, there was a monies for public wetlands and it, a new pot of money came up for private. And I had about five, four, three acres that had been all a native viburnum and a viburnum leaf beetle came in, killed it all. And I was watching it grow up to honeysuckle and other invasives, super wet land, not a wetland, but wet land. And they made it into a, a beautiful wetland uh, with an island. And within a one week, I saw birds there that I had never seen because they were called in with the, to the wetland. Um, so it, it went in last year, thank God, when it was dry and it immediately filled up and 
Um, you know, we can like boat around it a little bit. Um, but that that kind of work really helps to pr protect streams downstream. Um, and of course, Danby, you, we're right on the divide, right? So part of our, my, where I live on Curtis Road is in the Susquehanna, eventually the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And anybody too much uh, further north from me, you're all in the St. Lawrence. Um, so we need to protect both waterways. Um, and the final bright light is um, farmers who are recognizing the power of online marketing, online social media. Um, there are some really bright lights on that, that farmers can really directly reach out to um, their uh, potential buyers and kind of get them involved in the farm, if only socially, like through social media, through Instagram, through Facebook. And they, they're learning how to take pictures and really engage their, their customers. Um, and I think that, that that's a real great game changer for some of our smaller farmers. Um, uh, if, if you don't already follow a few of your favorite farmers, follow them on Instagram or, or um, Facebook. And I guess I'll, I'll also end up, it's all talk unless we buy the products from them, right? So yes, their eggs are going to be a little bit more money. Yes, you know, the, the yarn from Alyssa is going to be a little more money than if you go to Joanne Fabrics. But we got to put our money where our mouth is, right? If we really want um, this area's agriculture to thrive, then we need to put our money where our mouth is. That, that's it for me. I got on a soapbox, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> Lindsay's seeing a new part of me. I don't usually <laughs> like that. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> usually more measured. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, I need to hear from Lindsay Wickham. And right. uh, I have a little introduction from him. And he has been with the New York State Farm Bureau uh, for 22 years. He specializes in local issues. He is a state and federal lobbyist for the Farm Bureau. Uh, he resides in Schuyler County where his family operates a fruit farm in Hector, uh, raising wine grapes, peaches, cherries, apples, and pears. So let us tell us what we need to know, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, yeah, and first, first thing I want to say is I want to give the town, you know, the CAC and the Ag Working Group, I mean, just a ton of credit. Because in my job, most of the time I'm reacting to stuff versus getting in front of it. And, um, you know, the fact that you guys are getting in front of this with some proposed zoning issues and whatever is, is fantastic. And, um, you know, that just eliminates a lot of problems down there, especially with agriculture. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, yeah, but first, um, the Farm Bureau. So the New York Farm Bureau, who I work for, is part of a, a, a basic group of all the counties. So to make a very long story short, 110 years ago, the birth of Farm Bureau and Cooperative Extension happened in Broome County. This was for the whole nation um, with the hiring of the first ag agent in 1911. And it was uh, done through the Chamber of Commerce. It was a partnership with the Chamber, Cornell University, the railroad, and, um, and some local farms. That's the name Bureau, you know, Visitors Bureau, Convention Bureau, Farm Bureau. Um, shortly thereafter, other farm bureaus started popping up across the southern tier, and it spread to become a nationwide cause. And uh, basically, the modern extension system was born uh, shortly thereafter with the Smith Lever Act. Um, so it was called the Farm and Home Bureau, but the, it was before it was called Extension. Then in 1955, the federal government said, hold it, you know, you're teaching people how to raise crops, you're, uh, you know, but you're also lobbying us on regulation and, and, and stuff. And so something needs to happen here. So in 1955, they passed the law that split the Farm Bureau, the Farm and Home Bureau into two entities. One would be cooperative, the modern cooperative extension that we all know and love that we know is associated with the land grant universities across the nation. And the other being the Farm Bureau, which is now a private organization 
that uh, is an advocacy and lobbying organization on behalf of not only farmers, but rural Americans, um, hunters. Uh, we're probably the top hunting lobby in New York State. Um, but again, every county in the United States has the County Farm Bureau with a volunteer board of directors. And um, in, in New York, when you join Tompkins County Farm Bureau, you also join New York Farm Bureau and the American Farm Bureau Federation, which is made up of 50 states and Puerto Rico. And uh, you know, so and it's grown like the Farm Bureau as a private organization has over 6 million families. You join as a family, family members across the country. So we like to think we, we know what's going on, but you never know. So, um, you know, and I mentioned, so we're an advocacy and lobbying organization. About three weeks ago, I took a group of 10 farmers from the Southern tier to Washington for three days. Um, and again, nothing looks better than when you bring farmers with you. And what makes our organization very unique is our grassroots policy. All of our, all of our policies that we lobby on all come from our county farm bureaus and are voted on by farmer delegates across the state. And once they pass a policy, um, it goes into our policy book and we can then start working on it. Um, today, I was actually giving a talk uh, to the Broom Leadership Institute down in Binghamton at a brewery. And one of the bills we helped write was the Farm Brewery Act. Uh, Farm Brewery Act, Farm Winery Act, Farm Distillery Act. Um, I've been Farm Bureau's kind of go-to guy in a lot. Of, I grew up in the wine business. And so it's always nice when I can tell people that I helped write the Farm Brewery Act. And there's, and then welcome to Phil Wild a little late. So, um, so you know, at, at the in Farm Bureau at the county level, you'll see a lot of work done within the county and with different municipalities, uh, uh, whether it be county level, town level, village level. Um, obviously, I deal more with state and federal issues. But again, one of my jobs also is to work with towns and other municipalities. Um, you know, because my first job is to represent farms and help them out as a resource, uh, help when they have issues, whether it be with code enforcement or whomever. But also I turn that around and help towns quite often uh, with issues. But again, sometimes I have to help code enforcement out with, a, with an issue. So um, we kind of cover the full gamut when it comes to uh, helping farms out. So um, that's kind of that. So a lot of the big legislation you hear, um, you know, senators and assemblymen will approach us about helping them write it. And, um, and then we go from there. I mean, the big hot issues in New York right now, you know, as Barb said, New York, A, is not to real business friendly to begin with. And then you throw in the farming aspect and it goes downhill from there. And, um, you know, labor has been a very big issue for us, uh, both at the federal and state level, the state level more about wages and hours and the federal level more about uh, immigration and workers. So um, they kind of go hand in hand, obviously. And uh, just like any business right now, especially post COVID labor is, is hard to come by. And, uh, you know, it's been a big struggle as, you know, Barb noted, um, a lot of farmers work off the farm. Well, I'm a great example. Up until I was 36, I was a full-time farmer. And now for the last 22 years, I've worked for New York Farm Bureau full-time and farmed on the side. You know, I have brothers that uh, the help with the farm. So, you know, we all work off the farm. Um, you know, but the pay obvious things that most people just take for granted, like health insurance. Um, very big issue for our farm families um, is how to pay for health insurance. Um, farms are, are interesting because they want to be considered businesses most of the time. <laughs> But then sometimes, you know, as Barb said, they just would have to wear so many hats and it's been very tough on them. Um, so that, that's what the farmer does. We do also, you know, work a lot with schools, FFA chapters. Uh, Tompkins County now has three FFA chapters, Groton, Lansing, and then there's one at BOCES and they're working on uh, forming one in Dryden. FFA is what's called Future Farmers of America. And that basically goes right along with the high school ag program. And the, the fastest growing, um, the fastest growing, uh, what's the word I want to use for schools? Uh, you know, schools is ag programs. Uh, Tioga County 10 years ago had zero ag programs 
in their five school systems. They now have five. So it's a very growing thing. Uh, ag education can take the place of other, uh, other companies like chemistry, biology, and they can do ag programs. So um, with that, I'd like to kind of roll into the, the part that I think is really important for you guys is um, you know, to understand kind of where towns fit in to the agricultural entity and how they can work with ag and markets and move forward with that. So Betsy had mentioned um, ag districts. Uh, so ag districts are part of the New York State right to farm law, but they are a county run program through your county planning department. And what an ag district is, is literally, um, they're just what they sound like. They're, they're a geographic area. Uh, the farmlands that are included in ag districts are done through a simple application. And typically, uh, when is, uh, I'm trying to shorten this up so I don't complicate it too much, but uh, all it's got to be is viable ag land. Uh, Tompkins County has an annual inclusion to the ag districts. Um, so when you're trying to get land into the ag districts, it's got to be not only viable ag land on an annual basis, but it's got to be working farmland for the most part. There can be some woodlots included. Uh, we've seen a lot of work in Tompkins County with agroforestry. Um, you know, but um, so what, what an ag district does is it offers two basic things. Uh, one is it protects the farmer from nuisance lawsuits, nuisance neighbors, as long as they're following what's called accepted ag practices. Um, you know, as long as they're farming properly, basically. And you would never guess what the definition of a farm is in New York. This is basically the legal definition is a farm is an agricultural entity that is trying to make money. It doesn't matter if you make money or lose money. As long as you're trying to make money, you are considering a farm under the eyes of New York State and ag and markets. Um, there are some restrictions when we start getting into some of the tax abatements and tax exemptions that farms can be eligible for. Then we start talking about acreage and money. But to be a farm in New York and to be protected by the right to farm law, you just got to be doing agriculture and trying to make money at it. Not to say making a living at it, just making money at it. Um, I mean, I have a horse rescue operation in Schuyler County that normally has 20 horses, about 100 acres, make a lot of hay. They don't sell anything. So under the guise of New York State, they are not a farm. And they have no protections uh, via the right to farm law. So. Um, I don't want to, and you know, you mentioned zoning. So ag district protection actually overrides zoning. Now in New York state, by the via, via the New York state constitution, you can practice and perform agriculture anywhere, everywhere at any time in New York state. Now where that changes is we are a home rule state. So municipalities, towns, villages, cities can do zoning and override that constitutional right as you did in the hamlet of Danby. You know, you said everywhere else, you know, everybody has, you know, everything's zoned agriculture. Now, if there was an existing farm in the hamlet of Danby that was in an ag district, they would override that zoning and there's nothing anybody could do about it. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing in New York State is a town can pass anything, literally anything for or against agriculture. I had a town put a moratorium on animal agriculture about 20 years ago, and they didn't realize that if you're in an ag district, they can't do that. Um, they just wanted to get a gr gr grip on what was going on because there's a lot of influx of beef cows and dairy cows. Um, you know, that's great for the average person, but for anybody in an ag district, they cannot do that. The way the ag district protection works is if you're gonna do any, put any undue, um, you know, stress or if it's gonna cause the farm any, basically any grief, uh, all the farmer has to really do is complain. Again, you, you could ban animal agriculture on Danby, and as long as nobody complains, you're gonna get away with it. But if one farmer complains because the code enforcement stopped by and said, you need to get rid of those cows, then he can go to New York State and New York State will back him on the right to farm. So that just overrides zoning. Um, 
There's also ag assessment, um, which is a whole nother deal. People get confused all the time about ag assessment. That is just a property tax break for a farmer uh, to basically lower his land value to the value of the soil and the crops that can grow. So I know in my town, I'm in the town of Dix, which includes Watkins Glen, average acre of land is assessed for close to $2,500. But if you get ag assessment because you're a farmer, um, that may lower that fee depending on the quality of your soil, anywhere between $700,000, $1,200. You know, so it can more than half the property value you know, because again, farmers um, have a lot of land. So that would put a very much an undue burden on them. Um, you know, so one of the takeaways I would like to, you know, put in with this is that, you know, whatever you do in the town of Danby, and it doesn't matter if it's zoning, updating zoning, new zoning, any other local law, if in any way it includes agriculture or possibly could affect agriculture, Ag and Markets is more than glad to review a local law before it ever goes to public notice, public hearing, or uh, become law, and point out where it might cross with the Ag District's law and the right to farm law. They do that gratis, and it usually just takes a couple days. Um, so I, I would just urge you to follow through with that and rely on, on Ag and Markets to review your laws, your proposed laws beforehand. That just saves all of us, me, the farmer, ag and markets, a lot of time, and the town time, possibly time and money. Um, just dealing with a farmer today down in Shimon County that's going to have to sue their local town. Uh, she doesn't want to, but they kind of forced her into it. And towns towns don't have the money right now to uh, to deal with litigation. So um, one of the other things I wanted to mention was. You know, what you got to realize, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate Tompkins County and the work they do with farms, you know, with the, the smaller farms. The smaller farms are making a comeback. We're seeing a, a cycle. Um, a couple of years ago, I was talking with Chuck Schumer, of all people. I had five minutes with Chuck alone down in Washington. And, you know, and I said, to, told him that their rules and regulation were forcing our farms to consolidate, especially dairy farms, kale, snow. Um, you know, and, um, yeah, I go, then, then you look, come back to us and complain about the environmental aspect of the larger farms when that's the only farms that can survive anymore. So it's a real problem, especially on the dairy front. And, um, I was trying to think where I'm even going with that, but, uh, you know, I really appreciate what Tompkins County does supporting the local farmer, but another misconception out there. And I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way because I'm as supportive of the local food movement as anybody. The local food movement, now Tompkins County is a little higher percentage than most counties in terms of who buys and uses local food. But in a typical county, the percentage of people that get fed by local food, I would guess a half a percent is high. Now in Tompkins County, I could see it being several percent. Um, you know, again, it's not just farming, but the world in general. I call it uh, the Walmarting of the world. Um, you know, all our people are moving into the suburbs and they all want convenience. And um, that's creating these bottlenecks. Um, you know, just the fact to feed 350 million people when, you know, 250 million of them live in the suburbs of the cities is quite a task for our farm community. And, you know, that kind of brings me back to the dairy farm situation. Bergens between their two farms in Schuyler County have about 5,000 milking cows between the two farms. Now, most of the people in Central New York are going to be aghast by that saying, oh my God, a factory farm, this monster farm. In the big picture of things outside of New York State, they are a small farm. You get into the Western states and if you're not 10 to 20,000 cows, you're nothing. Out there, you're looking at 20 to 100,000 cows on a farm. And imagine that environmental nightmare getting that, you know, again, they all follow uh, nutrient management plans uh, through the EPA, through their CAFO plans. But, um, you know, this is what our legislatures are kind of forced, they're forcing our hands. And it's a real travesty. And I just really love the support, you know, that counties put into supporting their smaller farms. Uh, Lindsay? Yes, sir. Um, 
one of my boys had just worked with a dairy farm in the Central Valley of California. They milk 10,000 cows and generate a million gallons of waste a day. Wow. A million gallons. Yeah. So, so you know, we, we've got it pretty good here. And, um, you know, and one thing I, I always point out, and uh, we're very big on this, that farmers, farmers are the original stewards of the land. They live off the land. And if the soil's not healthy, if the water's not pure, they're not going to make money. You know, they're not really making money now, but it just, you know, hampers them. And, you know, so again, I applaud Tompkins County, the town Danby for, you know, for, for pushing this because, I mean, you're seeing the growth in the, in the Hamlet itself. And, um, you know, just with, with people moving, you know, the, the biggest nightmare I have, and I don't want to offend anybody who's on this call is when urban people move out to the country and get on their town planning board or their town board and start griping about farmers. And it may not happen in Tompkins County, but trust me when I tell you it happens everywhere. Um, and they gotta understand is you know, in New York state, we actually have a real estate disclosure law to where if you're moving into an ag district, um, you sign a paper at your closing that says, I understand the site sound smells of farming and know that I'm moving into a farming community. And, um, you know, and not many states have that. And, uh, but it still doesn't deter people from, uh, you know, from causing a ruckus. Uh, our farmers have a hard enough job as it is, but, uh, um, so I, I think oh, one other point I wanted to bring up is the farming dollar. So American Farmland Trust has done many studies over the years of, of where dollars go. So the typical industrial dollar in any given municipality typically rattles around in the community one to three times. So for every dollar they earn, you know, you, you may end up getting $2 out of it or $3 in your community. A farming dollar in any given community will rattle around about seven times. So if a farmer produces, you know, maybe pays $30,000 in taxes, he's really generating probably closer to 210, you know, $200,000 in income for any given municipality um, because they're homegrown people and they spend their money locally. And, um, the, you know, obviously a great addition that way, as well as, as Barb pointed out very heavily, the environmental side. So, um, you know, I'd, I like to, I'd like to actually amplify that. Um, not only is there an economic benefit, uh, I think something that's been underappreciated is that the children of farmers are farmers themselves and children of the farmers are the glue that keeps these rural co communities going. And when we get to the larger farms, we are losing that family um, farm mentality that work together, pull together, help each other's out. And I think, I think we're, we're, we're losing that at our peril. Right on. Yeah. And one other number I'll throw out is cost of services. So the average suburban household in New York state for every dollar of taxes paid use about a, somewhere between a dollar and a quarter and a dollar 50 in services. The average farmer for every dollar he pays in property taxes uses between 60 and 75 cents in services. So that helps offset some of the, uh, you know, some of the suburban issues. Again, these are all studies you can find on the American Farmland Trust website or through them. So, um, but just, you know, some of, some of the good that, uh, that the farm, farms do a lot of good. Hi, Phil. Phil, look like I want to say something. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's kind of my point, you know, so, you know, Farm Bureau is in, in Tompkins County. We have a, a board. The current president is uh, Kate Catherine Cole, who works at the Cornell Vet School, whose husband is one of the uh, principals up at uh, Walnut Ridge in Lansing. Um, many people may know Lynn Davidson, retired from Cornell, crop farmer. He's the vice, longtime president, now the vice president. Um, also a great resource. He was going to be my fill-in if I couldn't make it. As he has served for many years on the Lansing Planning Board. And, and if you ever need some good advice about agriculture, he's very good at that. So, and again, 
I love being a resource for towns and uh, I'm always here, uh, you know, as well. I've covered Tom. This is my second stint covering Tompkins County. Um, I didn't originally have them and then I picked them up for a couple of years as a interim. And then I've been back now for, I think, four years. So, uh, but again, growing up in Hector and still farming Hector and a Cornell grad, I, I do frequent Tompkins County quite often. So for social and other reasons. So, um, so I appreciate it. Well, but I do want to say something, and and I, you know, I've been a very proud member of Farm Bureau ever since I realized how, you know, how it was about real agriculture and not just, you know, just lifestyle. And I'm wondering, Lindsay, what kind of person should become a part of Farm Bureau? What kind of, what kind of support can you offer the person who's not making any money at it, but is enjoying the lifestyle of the farm and, and wants to protect themselves? Can Farm Bureau help people who aren't big dollar makers? So the answer is very much yes. I mean, as we always like to say, say to people, or we have farmers who all say it all the time is that especially small farmers who can't hire a lot of labor, don't have time to go to Albany or go to Washington. Um, you know, we represent farmers of all sizes. And, you know, again, with our grassroots policy development, um, you know, even the smallest of farmer can come to a policy development meeting and propose whatever. And it's amazing to watch the support from the large farms for these small guys because most of them started out that size themselves. And, uh, you know, and a lot of our members, you know, I'll, I'll say 20% of our members are not even farmers at all. Um, they're just supporters of what we do. Um, Cause again, if we don't stick together, where's our voice to stop, um, you know, le harmful legislation. And, um, you know, one of the things you know, that we're, you know, we're very proud of is that agriculture is the great uniter. It's, it's as nonpartisan as you can get because everybody's got to eat. And, you know, so, you know, I will tell you though, on my trip to Washington, it's the first time in 22 years that it was, Washington was as gloom as it could be. This was three weeks ago. And it didn't matter what office you went into, Democrat or Republican, it was gloom and doom. And just something that, that's just got to stop. And again, I appreciate Tompkins County to kind of be a, as a whole. And, uh, um, you know, there just wasn't, there's not normally the divide that you see, but I have never seen Washington that gloom and doomy. So there's that doom and gloomy. So, um, you know, we'll see. It's, it's a mess right now. And, uh, you know, so it doesn't matter, Phil. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer, non-farmer, small, big, organic, non-organic. Um, we represent you all and, um, you know, and, and work proudly at that. And like I said, it's great when you get 150 delegates in a room from all every county in New York and to see the 5,000 cow dairy farmer sticking up for the five acre garlic grower or whatever. Um, you know, cause we know if we don't stick together, you know, it's, it's not good. It's not good as it is. And, uh, you know, and it's a great point is, we have to keep selling ourselves no matter how good it is. And New York State isn't making it easier on us. So, Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay can I ask yes, you some questions on things you mentioned? I can think, first of all, you mentioned a controversial issue there, a labor, uh, salaries, immigrants. How yes. does that all fit? I'm going to ask that question. Uh, if Danby if somebody wanted to open a, a CAFO in Danby, you're saying they could no matter what? I mean, that's kind of shocking. And uh, so, two, uh, how do we lobby, three rather, how do we support and lobby for uh, changing the policy that, as you say, is encouraging the larger farms and change the policy to make it mm -hmm. encourage small distributed farming? Right. Remind me what number two was, Betsy. <laughs> that was uh, how do we avoid having a CAFO open in Danby? Okay. So I must have missed number one somewhere, but uh, it was number I'll one to... was labor and salaries okay. and immigrants. So in New York State, the biggest thing we deal with, obviously, uh, labor in terms of personnel, we don't worry about that at the state level very much. 
Um, I will tell you that farmers for the larger farmers for the most part have turned to migrant labor. Now, in, even in Tompkins County, there's um, not a lot of farms, but there are some that are using migrant. I mean, Chow uses them up at uh, Stick and Stone. Um, you know, so, but at the state level, our biggest issues are, um, you know, I know Tompkins County has always pushed cost of living money. Again, we're just trying to work with what our inputs are. So our inputs in terms of income for farms, until it gets better, we're gonna do everything we can to keep the minimum wage where it is. But I will tell you that very few farmers pay minimum wage. When I was uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, my migrants who worked for a crew, so they only, I only saw them a couple times a summer, they were making between 15 and $25 an hour. What most people don't realize about migrants is that they are here to work and that's all they want to do. They're here for three to five years and they want to make as much money as they can. They wire most of it home as they get it. And then they want to go home and live like a king. So I used to love it when the migrants came because I knew I was going to get the work done. But I also dreaded it a little bit because I knew I was going to be working from daylight till sunset every day until they left. But that's how they wanted it. You know, they would have it no other way. And... You know, one of the things that's going to drive them away is so if you've been paying attention to the state labor issue, we now have an ag wage labor board or an ag labor wage board um, that's voted for the last three years. We finally we've been fighting off labor bills, ag labor bills for decades. And finally, two years ago, when the Senate flipped. So now all of our leadership in Albany is all. Uh, democratic, so we don't have any checks and balances there, which we've always had, is they passed an ag labor bill. So one of the concessions we gave into was 60 hours max before overtime. Now, some people say, well, that's slave labor. Gotta remember, farming is a way of life. And I don't know if any farmers, honestly, they're gonna argue about that too much, but we've been just, praying the last two years this year well this year is coming up in december that the three member uh ag labor wage board who one of the members happens to be our president so we know we have one vote the other two votes are union and uh economic development gal out of buffalo and last year due to covid you know we we're able to keep it at 60 hours um I am afraid what may happen in December this year. Um, again, New York is a high cost state to do business in to begin with. So we're at a competitive disadvantage, especially in the dairy industry in the Northeast. And you keep throwing things at us and the margin is so tight now that um, you know, all of a sudden if they have to start paying minimum or um, overtime at 40 hours, A, with the labor shortage and B, just with the labor shortage, it's going to force that. And um, it's just another nail in the coffin. So, so that's, that's where we differentiate. You know, the, the federal level is migrant labor. If we could get American labor, we would love it. But I'll tell you, there's farmers out there who would never hire another American again because the Mexicans come in and they work 12, 13 hours a day and get the job done. And it's amazing to watch them. I mean, I'm just an envy of them. Um, you know, and the typical American comes to a farm and works for a week or two and quits. You know, because it is hard work. There's no question it's hard work. So um, so that's where we look at the federal government. And all we ask for is a safe, uh, legal workforce. And um, so, um, especially with dairy farms, H-2A workers are not eligible for dairy legally because it's only a 10-month visa. Dairy, again, is 12 months, 365, seven days a week. So... Yes, Phil, I see you unmuted again. Well, no, I was going to say that another side of this that we haven't mentioned is that I have very close friends who are dairy farmers. I went to the ag school so long ago. And I mean, people like Rob Donnan, who we both know, they both work with Guatemalan immigrants and they absolutely are family. They care about each other in a way that's absolutely not you know, recognized by an awful lot of, of the people who, you know, demand a lot of protections for them. I think that most dairy farmers that I know treat most of their workers like true family. 
because it is the lifestyle you choose. It's like, it is, it, you know, on Union Station in Washington, D.C., it says best home of the family, the farm. It's like it, there is a family connection that I think most people don't see with the immigrant labor force. So I just wanted to put that in there. I mean, they really are caring, a lot of the farmers. Yeah. So I, I hear what you're saying, Lindsay. I, I hear what you're saying. It's the complex issue and a lot of parts to it that um, don't fit the, the stereotype. Correct. And so I, I, I'm not going to push you to continue that discussion. I just wanted to hear what you had to say. Um, yeah. But I, I also want to hear about CAFOs in Danby. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> um, so CAFOs, so CAFOs stand for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. And um, again, and it's under the Clean Water Act uh, through the EPA uh, in New York State, it is all governed by the DEC, who is the, who is the police force for the EPA in New York State. Um, so any farm, and Cal, you may have to help me out here. Um, large CAFOs, I believe over 700 cows. And they have to follow a very strict um, nutrient management plan. Uh, it's called a CNA, CN, CNMAP, country, constant, or uh, and does it. Comprehensive Nutrient, nutrient management, management Plan. plan. And, um, you know, which really controls where they spread the manure. They got to have a certain amount of acreage, you know, for manure spreadage. Um, so that's very thing. You know, you know, so you, A, the chance of you ever getting one are slim just because of the acreage requirements. Uh, but B, unless there was already a district property that it would take at this point an expansion um, probably of a current, but I don't know that there's any dairies in Danby anymore. Um, but you would know, you would know. And can you stop it? So it's funny because I can bring you right over to Newark Valley in Tioga County. Um, a guy from Pennsylvania came up here about, I don't know, 10 years ago and built a pig facility, a swine facility. Now I know the guy quite well and I've helped him out uh, because again, he's in an ag district. He follows a very strict CAFO program. He has been working with Cornell heavily to try to control his odors um but pretty much at every town board meeting um they tried to pass a local law to prevent Lindsay, Lindsay, to I'm sorry cases. I have to I'm sorry I have to interrupt you there is a guy that's a farmer local farmer that has to leave and I I wanted him okay. to say a few words so I I'm gonna have to interrupt and let him speak do you want to speak uh, John or do you have time yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset the flow of anything. I just, I got a, I got a thing I got to be at. Um, uh, it's been really interesting hearing both of you speak. Um, Barb, I think we're neighbors. I think I met you the other day uh, um, with my dog. Wait, are you the uh, one that complimented my pastures? Yeah, those are beautiful pastures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you met you my met dog too. Over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I just have a, I mean, I was relating to some of you guys are saying I, I have a very, very small vegetable operation. It's a, uh, I cultivate a little under an acre. I have a 45 member CSA and I do some wholesale. Um, and yeah, this is my second year in operation. Um, and, uh, I do like minimal tilling and, um, and uh, mixed vegetable production, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I use some season extension techniques. I have um, high tunnels that I grow throughout the winter. So the CSA runs. I have multiple CSAs, but they go. I produce vegetables from about March to January. Um, so uh, and then I'm I'm hoping to expand into doing some value added products. And I do a lot of pickling and preserving. Um, so I'm hoping to figure out a way where I, I, the, the tricky part is like, um, 
like you're saying, like, like you were saying, Barb, you wear so many hats as a farmer uh, that like figuring out how to produce vegetables with consistency is one thing, but then on top of that, starting a food business um, and running that as well is like a pretty daunting thing. Um, but uh, I'm trying to kind of take it slow. I'm in a fairly privileged position where like uh, a lot of I'm, I'm on I'm renting land and it's on uh, kind of like an old farm incubator uh, like uh, Remembrance Farm started here and Lucy and Chow started here and um, so there was some infrastructure already in place so I was like able to kind of hit the ground running um, so I, I'm kind of I'm in a position where I didn't have to put down a lot of money to start the farm so I'm like uh, able to kind of take things uh, fairly slow, but um, still figuring out how to, uh, you know, put together a full income. But yeah, I'm excited to hear that there's gonna, that, that some of the zoning will have potential to um, benefit cooperatives. Cause I feel like there could be a lot of um, benefit in having a community kitchen in Danby or something. And like, you know, like, um, because that is a huge hurdle is like the certified kitchen aspect of, of, of getting certified, uh, of getting uh, value added products going. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't, there's not a whole lot more I need to say, but. Um, hey John, John, do you yeah. know with the new, with the new Ithaca farm market design, is a certified kitchen included in that? I'm not sure. I've, I've only heard a little bit about that. One of my friends is on the board and he was just telling me about it the other day, but that would be That'd be really cool. Broom, Broom County put one in their regional farm market and it's been a big hit. So. Yeah. That's good to know. I, I'll look into that. Okay, right on. Cool. Well, um, yeah, if anyone has any other questions, otherwise. Uh, well, I can I'll testify that John's vegetables are amazing. I have <laughs> seen them at the Danby market that they have every third Friday at the Dotson Park and the, it's, they're just beautiful. They're aesthetic <laughs> treat. And he used to be uh, a sous chef for, uh, what is it? Um, the Carriage House. Uh, Carriage House Cafe for years. yeah. Oh. So this man yeah. cooks, I mean, he knows how to do things with them. And <laughs> I'm really excited to think, you know, that I can buy some <laughs> kimchi or something. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. And, so thank you for yeah. coming I, I we will of let course. you go and do your other commitment yeah no worries i'll just say thank one more thing much. um the farm is called shagbark gardens you can follow us on instagram and if you want to come meet me i'll be at the um brookton or yeah the brooktondale apple festival on uh saturday selling veggies so yeah um but it's thanks again for having me road. yeah steam, steam mill road. yeah and we have a little homestead we raise some animals as well but yeah all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. And, and I'll you. stop by sometime. Yeah, yeah, please do, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to just go on to the last question, Lindsay, about um, the us lobbying yes. uh, federal government for changes in their policy that will benefit small farmers. How do we do that? So, I mean, there's obviously two ways, and the obvious one is to join Farm Bureau and let your voice be heard. Um, you know, it's amazing how much policy has come out of Tompkins County over the years, um, you know, that has gone on to be lobbied on at either the federal or state level. And that's how we work. Again, it all comes out of your mouth and gets voted on at your county level to state level, and then at the national level for federal policy. So, um, other than that is, again, we urge advocacy. Um, you know, I can, I'm lucky because I'm also a farmer. So when I lobby on farming issues, again, I got some natural street cred, but, uh, you know, it always looks good when, when the actual um, constituents, you know, are the ones reach out to your, reach out to your assemblymen, senators, um, congressmen, you know, they will listen. They do listen. You know, they're, they're, the first job, everybody, everybody know what the first job of a politician is, right? It's not, to, it's not, not you constituents, it's to get reelected, right? So, but the number two job is to listen to their constituency. So, um, you know, yeah, we provide that voice to some extent, but we also like to include our members. 
Um, like I said, anybody can join Farm Bureau, but uh, you know, I would urge anybody at any time to be active politically in terms of communicating with your elected officials. Um, how, however active you want to get otherwise politically is up to you. But again, your elected officials are your, you hired them. It's kind of like when lawyers tell you what to do, you hired the damn lawyer, tell them what to do for you. Right. So it's the same with your elected <laughs> officials. So I always love that. I always love to be able to turn that around on my lawyer and say, look, dude, you you work for me. So, you know, but that's just something to keep in mind. So, but, you know, just Betsy, one thing on the CAFO thing is there's probably not enough land for sale in Danby to even have a CAFO. And again, minimums, right now, the only thing that's regulated, I could say medium CAFOs are somewhat regulated, but not much. That's 300 animals. Uh, but large CAFOs, I just don't see it. I don't see how it physically can happen in Danby. Okay, that's reassuring. Yes. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Lindsay before we go on to um, Kristen Loria and Stephen Walensky, who are members of um, the Eco Village here in Danby? So, Anybody have any questions for either Barb or Lindsay? Thank you very, very much for your help and coming. I appreciate it. Okay, Kristen, are you there? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Well, talk to us, and, and Stephen, talk to us. You can talk to each other and talk to us. <laughs> okay, maybe Steve should start because he, was farming here before me. Not, okay. not too much longer, but yeah. Um, I had been wanting to, I had, had a plan in my mind to start farming here in Danby when I moved about 13 years ago, but I had young children and was working a job and it was too much. Um, my kids got old enough where I decided about three years ago to actually get started. And I had decided on an, um, a silvo pasture model um, combining hazelnuts uh, with grazing sheep. Um, part of this came from um, some of our local resources that we have here in Tompkins County. Uh, Steve Gabriel, you know, he wrote a book on silvo pasture, and I had gone to a couple talks, um, and it really resonated with me with wanting to do perennial agriculture um, and have animals as well. Um, the timing was also perfect. There was an organization starting um, between Tompkins and Cortland County called NITCA, the New York Tree Crops Alliance, which is a cooperative that's, um, whose goal is to share processing equipment for hazelnuts and chestnuts to make value-added goods with the goal of mainly doing chestnut flour and hazelnut oil, but eventually doing you know, hazelnut butter as well um, and uh, hazelnut flour, though that's much more of a niche product. Uh, so NITCA incorporated back in 2019. Uh, we currently have an oil press, um, a cracker for cracking hazelnut shells, um, and we've recently submitted um, a grant proposal through the Edwards Mother Earth Foundation agroforestry program um, to get the rest of our equipment. Um, it's a fairly large grant, and that sort of thing, that that ability to do value added goods, you know, will allow us to make, you know, far more profit off of the trees that we're able to plant on a smaller area. So right now, uh, Kristen and I are sharing this five acre field. We're expanding probably next year into another five acre field. So we'll have 10 between us. Um, after meeting her and her interest in, in growing um, beans and grains, I decided since the sheep weren't going to be able to be grazed with the hazels for probably another six years when the hazels were mature enough that the sheep wouldn't damage them. Um, I would share the field and uh, we could just alley crop. And that has turned out to be really exciting and really great. And uh, I will let her talk more about her own contribution to this. Um, I'm growing hazels. Um, I'm not growing chestnuts. I do have walnuts as well. Um, but my primary focus is hazels. Um, and I'll let Kristen uh, talk about her own side of this. Yeah, yeah Steve. Couple of questions, real quick. Sure. Uh, how big are your alleys? 
So there's, it's a 30 foot spacing for the okay. first field. The second field, we're going to do 60 foot spacing to make it easier for her to plow. Because right now plowing those 30 foot alleys is a pain. I mean, her ability to like turn around easy and then come back through, it's like a lot more work than it needs to be. So the second field, there's going to be like less hazels, more annual crops. Um, but the current field is 30 foot spacing. And, and where are you getting your trees from? Are you get them from down in, was it Cander? Where's well, the, where? it's from all over. So one of the NITCA members, well, two of the NITCA members, both Akiva Silver mm -hmm. and um, Jeff Zarnowski, they both have farms. So Akiva's in Spencer. Yes. Um, That's what I was referring to. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I got about 250 from him. I got another two or 300 from Jeff. Um, a lot of them came from Forest Ag which I think is in, uh, it's the Midwest. It's not Michigan. I think it was Wisconsin. One of the, one of the very cold <laughs> upper states. They have a really good program with the local university there for um, hazel genetics, trying to get a really good cross between the European and the American um, varieties for like a, a, something that they can do open air seed that'll still retain some good genetics. We can basically throw the dice and try to get some really good varieties. Jeff himself has, has a couple clonal varieties, ones that he's tried to get um, uh, cultivars um, that are like his own, you know, that he has trademarked or copyrighted or whatever. Um, and the quality of those are incredible, but if you're planting a thousand hazels at a time, you can't pay $30 a shrub, it's impossible. <laughs> Whereas with, with Forest Ag and working through Jeff and um, Akiva, I was able to get them significantly cheaper than that um, while still retaining a good cross of hybrid genetics between the American and the European hazel, so. All right, last question, I mean, if you see me doing that because I got fruit flies because I have fruit and stuff, <laughs> Never mind. But anyways, have you guys heard of uh, Propagate Ventures out in Trumansburg? They're on the Hector side of Trumansburg but they are working on regenerative agricultural farm plans. I, I just became aware of them. They joined a couple months ago and are a national semifinalist for the Farm Bureau Ag Innovation Challenge mm -hmm. nationwide. And uh, what was the name of the organization again? It's called Propagate, Propagate Ventures. Ethan Steinberg is the CEO. They're over on Searsburg Road um, on the uh, west side of Trumansburg. Propagate yep. ventures. Um, but that's pretty much what you're describing as a lot of what they do. Oh, uh, so it's it's good life farm. I, I know people who have worked there before, like okay. actually worked on the farm. So I do know of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just wrote a small article about it. I've never met them, but when they when I do get to meet them, I'm gonna write an extensive article about them. But uh yeah, that, but it sounds like what you guys are trying to do. So cool. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. So Stephen, why, why are you plowing those aisle, those alleyways? Why aren't you trying to do some cover crop or whatever and work with that? Or is it just too difficult? Or Kristen, I should ask. Chris, Kristen did cover crop them actually. She did that uh -huh. back in 2020 she, before planting out this spring. So yeah, you're can, using- let, let her, She can fill in for that part. And, um, maybe, I think it will answer your question if I uh, tell a little bit what I'm, what I'm doing. What, so I'll answer the question in the, in the process. If that sounds good, Betsy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so my background is mostly in vegetable farming. Actually, I've been farming about 10 years, primarily in the Hudson Valley um, and moved. I grew up in Ithaca, but moved back here a few years ago. Um, I have a, a farm job as well. I, I have a master's in plant science and I'm working in ag research at Cornell on cover crops mostly as it happens. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, my partner and I moved to, to Whitehawk and um, I was interested in growing um, dry beans. So I kind of developed a side business growing dry beans as a vegetable grower and, and just became very passionate about sort of regional staple crop production and in particular um, dry beans, which is, you know, we have, we've been growing them here in New York for hundreds of years. Um, they're a, a very well adapted crop for our region, but they've really gone by the wayside. We used to grow, grow hundreds of thousands of acres of them um, in the 1800s. So, um, so anyway, I came, came to Whitehawk with that interest and um, it was 
kind of a pragmatic decision at first to, to share field space with Steve because he had a fence and he had already brush hogged and, and it was a little bit more accessible, but uh, we developed this idea um, you know, in Europe, alley cropping is a lot more common to combine tree crops with annual crops. Um, and so, um, like you mentioned, I'm growing in relatively narrow strips at the moment, totaling about an acre this year. Um, this was my first year, first season uh, with, with a cash crop. I planted cover crops in 2020 um, to prepare the ground. Um, for the beans this year. And um, like Steve mentioned, we're interested in opening up another field, doing wider spacing um, to just make it a little bit more um, practical in terms of uh, reducing edge space that I'm managing. Um, but in terms of where the beans are going, um, I am offering them through a, uh, I'm calling it a winter bean club and I'm working with Full Plate um, CSA, um, so, so it's an add-on to their CSA. So um, I'm really grateful, you know, here in Ithaca, they're a real force on the local um, ag scene and they, they have these side dishes that allow other farms to sort of work within their distribution systems um, to offer more options to their CSA members. And so, um, so I, yeah, I sold out of those already, which is exciting. Um, and um, basically I'm growing, thinking, you know, I know, I know this theme is value adding. And of course, for staple crops like beans and grains, it's often a very low value crop and you have to scale up. And, um, you know, I'm thinking of maxing out at around like five acres per year cultivated. I'm working with a two bottom plow. I have a little six foot disc. Um, I don't have a combine. Um, and so uh, grains lend themselves to larger equipment and mechanization. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that on a smaller scale. And for me, that means growing higher value varieties. So I'm growing um, heirlooms or heirloom type dry beans um, that, you know, people are willing to pay a lot more for. And I'm also working with other bean growers out in uh, the Penyan area, the Martins grow organic beans out there. So um, the bean club is basically a combination of their organic beans, um, you know, more conventional ones like, like pinto beans and black beans, and then I'm growing kind of more unique types. Um, and so kind of every step of the way, it's a collaboration, really. It's, uh, you know, Steve and I share a tractor and, and land, obviously. Um, and we hope to rotate animals. You know, I'm really interested in incorporating perennial crop rotations over time. So we hope to have sheep running through that land as well. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely um, going forward, I'm interested in um, developing sort of a mobile processing unit. So like a stationary thresher, a cleaner, that could be shared between um, multiple growers. So that's kind of the next step I'm working on is trying to get more people in the area interested in growing some dry beans and um, sharing equipment um, to make it, you know, just try and make it efficient enough um, to be a viable enterprise. Cause it, it is really a hard thing doing smaller scale field crops to make it make sense without, without a combine. So um, that's kind of a, a summary. Um. I think that's really exciting. I mean, it's really ambitious and collaborative what you guys are doing. It's and, and you should see the note from Barb. To yeah, I saw that. I I have met Lisa. Um, she is yeah. We we have geeked out over beans together for sure. <laughs> She's. I, I know Lisa pretty well. And I can see that. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> her collection is incredible. Yeah, I've grown out some of her. One in particular called Purple Stardust. I, I'm hoping to keep growing out because it's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, she's great. So, so Beth, Betsy, to answer, answer your question about plowing, as part of soil health, every once in a while you have to plow and even sometimes rip. We call it ripping. Um, you know, deep uh, to break up soil compaction, bring the health back for earthworms, bugs, whatever. Because if you don't, it just slowly compacts and becomes a rock. And 
So occasional plowing is is very necessary um, for sure. So. And yeah, I, I'm hoping to, um, so I have a moldboard plow that I'm using now. Um, I mean, frankly, right now I'm still battling all the, you know, this land was fallow for a long time. So I'm still battling perennials. Uh, you know, it takes some time to establish annual right. crops. Right. Um, lot, you know, I had goldenrod in the middle of my beans this year, especially because it was so wet. Yeah, I converted so, a, a goldenrod field to, yeah. to a vegetable garden and I, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, so the mold board has been crucial, especially in these early years. Um, but, you know, I'm interested in reducing tillage. The research that I work on is actually uh, a lot of it is working on organic no-till and reducing tillage um, because tillage is definitely, you know, a, a, a huge issue with organic production. Um, so uh, so that's something, you know, over time I'm interested in. It's but yeah, first I have to like, you know, <laughs> take take back from the goldenrod <laughs> um, in that field in particular. So um, yeah, but super early days, but um that's the, that's the idea. Thank you. Thank you very much for both of you. And, and so the last speaker we have, not, last but not least, is Kelvin. You can see him in there. He's a great person that I'm proud to introduce. He's third generation farmer uh, or more, and um, one of the last holdouts for dairy in the area. So, um, I, I have to say that uh, my husband and I were lucky enough to meet his parents when we started building uh, a house out in Caroline in the 70s, 1970s. And uh, an image that really sticks in my mind that I, his father, or maybe it was Calvin told me, was um, Dick Snow, his father, driving a wagon full of potatoes pulled by horses to sell to fraternities in Cornell in the 1950s. And I was, you know, I didn't even know that happened anymore when I was there in the 1970s. So it was really a strong vision. So um, Calvin, well, <laughs> tell me. Just, just listening to people today, you know, it's hard to know what to, to, to say or just to reflect on. And one of the things that come to mind is there was a book published in 1977 by Wendell Berry. It was called The Unsettling of America. And uh, we all here want to see it resettled. And one of his lines from the book is, eating is fundamentally an agricultural act. And people want to get back to that. They want to know the person that produced their food. They want to know where it came from, how it was done. And that's one of the beauties of the, the farmer's market and the local, um, this attempt to uh, reestablish that. And I know we're not on a fool's errand, but some days it feels like it. You know, you, you just, the small farms we're talking about in areas like Caroline and Danby and, you know, south end of Ithaca, Enfield, Newfield, you know, it's, the economies of scale are always going to beat you. But um, the economies of scale also, you know, what's the value of that food that's raised on uh, small, organically cared for, you know, and just the care that goes into things, you know. Um, I don't know that it can be um, quantified, at least not currently, in a lab that says this food is better for you than not. We, we produce a cheese. Um, we quit milking cows last November, and now I go down to a neighbor's and buy milk from them and make cheese one day a week. Um, it's from the cow to the curd is no more than four hours. And is that cheese... It's, you know, it's raw milk cheese, unpasteurized, just utter run as we call it. Is that cheese of a higher nutritional value to the person then that eats it than some milk that's been 
agitated and chilled and held and trucked and pumped and pushed and prodded and shoved. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't think we have the answers to that. And yet, um, as part of, uh, oh, I don't know the word for it, circumstantial, you know, all the health problems we see in people. And it seems to me that I think it's just bad food. And I think there's an attempt to get back to something that, that's raised locally, lovingly. Um, and you know, I, think it's, I think they're parameters that have been lost and forgotten. And you know, we're, in, we're in the throes of an energy crisis where they say the average length that the food on your plate travels 3,500 miles or some ridiculous number like that. And uh, you know, I don't know, but that's, forgive my, um, but, you know, and then, you know, there, there's so many things, so many possibilities. I think just listening to the people here, I feel like I've walked into the, a large library where there's nothing we can't solve, finish, you know, and make better. Um, the other day, I saw an article about uh, what to do with land we might be losing to um, solar farms. And they were talking about, you know, what could be, you know, could solar farms go up, the panels go up on higher towers, not way up, but then, you know, crops grown in under, we've talked about raising sheep in under them and things like that. And just hoping that those things, that are, they aren't just given lip service to, but things that can really happen. It's a suitability for, you know, the, the land we are, the land, the geography that we've been given in this area. I mean, geography is a certain destiny for what we can do. So um, it's just it's it's just so empowering to hear the the people that you've brought here today, and just you know their vision, um, and then the expertise and depth and background of people like Lindsay. Um, you know, it's just I'm 70 years old, and I just want to do what I can do to encourage to to keep keep keeping on. Cal, you, I say, Cal, you'd be proud to know that the 10 acre solar farm down the road from me, I came by it two days ago and they were letting goats into it. Uh, or not goats, but sheep. You can't do goats but, in solar farms. But they're, letting, they're letting sheep into the solar farm. Yeah, because so. some of the solar developers, it seems like they're promising this, but then I don't see it happening. Not that everything's got to happen in the twinkling of an eye, but, you know, it seems like they're, they're fenced in, but I just see them growing up to weeds. And it just, it just seems sad. I mean, there's just the aesthetic of, you know, there, there's something satisfying about cared for land. So uh, on a side, kind of a side sad note, a farmer next to me, about 200 acres, he's in his mid seventies and he's been approached by a solar, a solar farm to do up to maybe 200 acres. And I looked at him, I'm like, you need to do what's good for you. Um, you know, what do you tell, what do you tell when the average age of a farmer is 58, you know? Because yeah. these guys got to, the guys, you know, you want them to have some quality of life in their last years. And yeah, you know, I told him, I said, I'll give you, I'll get you a lawyer that'll help you negotiate and go for it. Yeah. yeah. The state mandate's killing us on solar power. So I'm going to yeah. jump in, but I, I we, least an acre to the Green Star Food Co-op for their solar and we put in our own solar and in, in learning those things of doing that I was speaking with them why can't a farmer do solar along their fence lines the entire length of a fence line put in that level of farming uh, uh, instead of taking out a of solar farming instead of taking out major acreage that can be used for other things. Yeah, rather than covering concentrated and why covering why not your why not your fence lines? And it's there's no difference in doing that than taking so the problem. So lines. Phil, uh -huh. if you read the leases, if, if you read the leases with these solar farms, mm -hmm. they can keep you from doing any agriculture in the adjacent oh, fields to it. I know it. Because I know of it. Dust, the, dust and other yeah. things. So it's ridiculous. That's why you got to have a good lawyer look through the lease. Yes. Again, it's your you're hiring them to put the solar panels on your thing, and so yeah, I, we do a lot of stuff with land leasing, especially solar and gas. Well, Lindsay, and then that's one of the things why you kind of have to team up with something like Farm Bureau because you just don't have the time, the expertise, or the pockets 
to have somebody look at your lease that you're going to do with Sun X or something, where Sun X has got a legal department, you know, and we're doing, they're doing a, um, there's a plan for a hundred and acre, 140 acre solar farm uh, down near Speedsville. Um, you know, and it's, you only getting, we're only getting one, we're only getting a, take seven acres to get a kill, 100 kilowatts. And that's really not very good. You know, it seems like it's, it's kind of a misappropriation of, whereas you take, you know, New Mexico or somewhere, you're getting, you know, only about an acre and a half or two for 100 kilowatts. Just remember the state mandate. The state mandate is driving all this, you know, to get yep. to 50% renewals by 2035, I think. And, you know, that's not the right reason. That's not the right reason to do this. So. No, it's not. And I don't know, I, it just, here again, this, this unsettling, uh, I just feel that it, there's not necessarily a technological fix to these sort of things. You know, we're going to close Millican Station, and then we're going to do a Bitcon operation that's going to consume way more juice than Millican ever started a thought of putting out. And you know, I just, I just don't, I just, it's frustrating. But you know, back to you know, but just you know, this lack lack of integration. I mean, the fabric of life is is amazing, and we we've, we've ripped it open. And, it just feel you feel like the, the, the I don't know and without being too nostalgic just the older ways of smaller scale and you could interrelate interrelate and understand and knew what was going on and as we just get so large and specialized you know it just a lot's been lost and um, I think we we're all trying to see it do do what we can to undo or you know the Walmarting of America. Yeah. Yep. So, but it's it's great to see, you know, what the the work and things that people are committed to. It's it's very encouraging. And so. Thank you, Calvin. I. I appreciate you coming and always appreciate listening to you. I think that uh, it's interesting to see the opposite side of a lot of liberal issues that perhaps aren't as simple as liberals might think. And it's interesting that uh, the complexity of things. Uh, I think that that kind of Excuse actually me, but just, complexity. Just try to read an article in the New York Times about agriculture. It is so goddamn wrong. I don't know where to start. <laughs> and yet, that 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 is the paper of the nation. It informs a huge, huge, huge suburban and urban population. And. They need a, they need I'd, an like cultural to, editor. I'd like you well, to send yeah. me the link Sorry. to that one. <laughs> well, I, I, does anybody have, oh, Elisa, a question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> it's uh, um, in response to what has been a fascinating uh, discussion. I came to this, um, to this presentation because I am a member of Mothers Out Front. And we have been involved in working against fossil fuels. We, we were very much involved in trying to see what we could do to prevent the um, uh, new Dominion, uh, Dominion's new market uh, pipeline going through Ellis Hollow um, and the, the uh, ill effects of the compressor station there. We've been involved in a lot of things, you know, anti anti-fossil fuels. And a group of us about a year ago decided that we really wanted to be involved in something that was more positive. So we had all read the book, um, Kiss the Ground, which is about uh, a fascinating book about regenerative agriculture and the, um, the power of, or the possibility that regenerative agriculture could really help us with the climate crisis. 
Um, we had read Drawdown as well. And, and so we have been exploring this, this topic and wanting to do something in the area to promote this. And one of the things that we did was we interviewed, um, I think a, a total of six or seven different local, um, mostly organic farmers, but some who were using regenerative um, methods. And the idea was that we would, and we uh, um, uh, wrote these articles and put them in the Tompkins Weekly. And our notion was that if we could educate people about the advantages of regenerative agriculture, that they would be willing uh, customers uh, and uh, in the hopes of, of doing just what you, some of you have been talking about, the need to, um, to market their products and to find it, you know, innovative ways to do that. Um, we didn't get much of a response, of course. We're looking, um, our next article is going to be an interview with Anna Kellis um, to, to talk to her in more detail about uh, this um, Soil Health and, and Resiliency Act, which is, uh, you probably know, Lindsay has gone through, has been passed both in the Assembly and in the Senate. And we are wanting to push it through and get it onto uh, Governor Hochul's desk. Now I'm asking you: Is that the kind of is that the kind of lobbying that you think could be effective? And do you have any thoughts about how we could make more of a racket about this? We know that Anna is very much in support of this, and we thought if we did an article in which we um, interview her about this this uh, law and put that in Tompkins Weekly, that that would inform people. Um, but you know, obviously we are not experts on 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 farming or um, as our uh, regenerative farming, I and mean, we've done what we can to inform ourselves about it and to, and to you know be a part of, of presentations like this. But we we are still sort of casting about to figure out what we just as a group of volunteer women, mothers out front, um, can do because we feel very passionate about this. But um, we're not we're just looking for ways to help the farmers and also to educate people. So, so Alyssa, that's great. You know, I love what you're doing. I really, really, truly do. And the conundrum that we are in, and I'm going to start by using the stretch of 96 that goes from Danby to Cander. And if you went a hundred years ago where there wasn't a hamlet, every parcel was a farm. If you went 50 years ago, where there wasn't a hamlet, probably half the parcels were a farm. Mm -hmm. You go today, that's not anything that's not a hamlet, how much of it is farming? And I bet you'd be surprised that it's probably like 25%. And, you know, so to go back to your original point is, yes, you guys should be contacting the governor's office to get her to pull that bill and sign it. When she took office, she has a stack of bills that is several feet deep that she's got to pull them and then sign and um, yeah. or not do anything or whatever. I mean, what, there's a lot of procedure there, but, you know, and it gets back to the sad part is, is can we ever get back to 100 years ago? No, there's no way. It's the Walmart of America. Yeah. People aren't willing to pay that extra dollar or two, you know, for this, that or whatever. And you know, so that's the sad aspect of it. You know, can the local, again, I go back to the local foods movement. Can the local foods movement survive? Of course it can, but just listen to what, um, look around, oh, like what, what Kristen was talking about. It's a tough business. And, you know, to make, to make any money at it. And we have become so robotic in our lives that if it's not about convenience, we're not doing it. And, it's frightening to me. It really is. It's going to drive me into retirement. The year I turn 60 in two years, I'm done. I can't take it any longer. Yeah. And I'm going to move on to the, I'm going to move out in the middle of nowhere and live on my own or me and my wife and just whatever. But, you know, so what can you do? I mean, obviously, you know, again, your, your group's name is just powerful in itself. <laughs> and it really is. And, um, yeah, but you're you're a voice, and you need to you know let that voice be heard um, by your elected officials. You know it's frustrating. I get it, and there's little battles that can be won. And um, 
you know, just, I've, I've always been called to meetings to be the reality person. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is we're never going back to a hundred years ago. We're just not, it's not going to happen. And you know, something big chunks of our country are going to fail and die because of it. And, um, you know, so I, I, I think, you know, turn that message into a positive message somehow, you know, railing against fossil fuels is great. Um, but you know, if you can turn something into a positive message, um, you'll garner much more support and, um, you know, but again, it comes down to your elected officials and, um, you know, one of the things that never happens is people like you, and I appreciate that you do this, is you talk to the local farmers and find out what they do need. Well, um, we did that. We did that. We found that extremely uh, enlightening and very encouraging. Yeah. I will no, say that, I, that I've known Cal Snow for quite a number of years now. First met him when I was taking a petition around Caroline to get people to to um, uh, sign up, uh, for a, a ban on fracking. Um, all right, Bet there. Betsy and I have been to Albany. We sat next to one another on a bus to Albany many years ago on the fra whole fracking issue. Um, you know, once you get started on, I mean, I've been doing this activism for probably about twelve years now. There's there's no stopping you. Um, and I really feel that the regenerative agriculture um, effort is, is a, an extremely important one. Yeah. So the good news is the soil health piece is taking off like a rocket. Yes. Uh, yes. We're seeing money at the federal, state, local level to deal with it. But I also have to, I'm going to steal a little Barb's, uh, Barb's deal here. Is, you know what's funny is one of the biggest misconceptions about Farm Bureau so I'm surprised we haven't crossed paths. I was New York Farm Bureau's natural gas guy. I traveled to almost every county in New York State and in the Northern Tier of Pennsylvania to give seminars about what to look out for in a lease. So we came out in support of fracking. Now, that's all anybody heard. What they didn't hear was the other 20 policies we have, but only if. You know, this safety measure was put in place. Only if this safety measure was played. And nobody ever saw that. And so one of the biggest misconceptions out there, I mean, I've had people crying at me, screaming at me, you know, whatever, is, yeah, we, we did support this moving forward in New York, but there were so many safety features built into our policy that it probably never would have happened anyways. <laughs> yeah, but our members, that's what our members voted on. So, yeah, yeah. well, I didn't mean to, you know, to get us off into that. that no, no, no. <laughs> that's no. a whole nother subject indeed. But, uh, but, um, but no, we appreciate, you know, one of the things we promote is activism amongst well, our yeah. members because farmers are typically a quiet bunch and they like to stay at home and work on the farm. So right. we heavily promote activism amongst our members. Well, we, we came up with a bumper sticker, which we would like to pr um, produce more of and, and uh, hand out to a lot more people, which says, um, farmers are heroes by local. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, Elisa, I, I'm yeah. sorry, but I didn't quite hear your question that you, uh, what was? It was to, to, to uh, grace it with the word question would be inappropriate. <laughs> it was just, you know, a few, but, but thoughts, a few the, thoughts on, on the matter. But, but it, I, I guess the one question I did have was whether Lindsay had any, any other ideas about what we could do in, in, in the way of lobbying, you know, how to put pressure on, on our local officials. Lobbying for what? For, oh, I'm sorry, for the Soil Health and Resiliency Act. And it is, it's basically in support of, of uh, regenerative agriculture practices. That, um, that passed, that passed on both It's houses. passed the Assembly and, and, and the Senate in New York State, and it's been sitting, as Lindsay has said, in a pile of, of oh, oh, um, things the for governor the governor to sign. So, so it, it, yeah, it, so it's just one of those things where um, my guess is she'll get to it. Mm -hmm. um you know it's funny because they usually try to tie it into an event or whatever we're through the growing season so i don't know where she you know but she doesn't have a whole lot longer to get calling those up i mean i think she has right. till january january for on january 1st so she's got a lot of work to do and um but but activism is key always and you'd be surprised how many people will never contact their elected officials 
So when you contact them, trust me when I tell you, they track it, they file it, yes. and they count it. Well, so, that's the, yeah, that's the kind of thing that Mothers Up Front feels that we, you know, we have, you know, sort of the, it doesn't take a lot of expertise to know how to do that kind of thing. Um, we've, been, we've been tabling, we have, we have a brochure about regenerative agriculture. We're just, you know, we're just trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. It would be great if we could find some way to get, you know, to contact farmers and say, listen, call your, you know, call, call the governor's office, say that you need that, that we need this bill to, uh, to be put into effect. But uh, slowly cooperative extension, Barb, uh, at one of our staff meetings about three or four weeks or maybe a month ago, we had a cooperative extension agent from out in Erie County, I believe, who was somewhat of an expert on you know, regenerative agriculture. You know, they're embracing it. And again, their job is to educate and reach out you know, to, to the farming community. And uh, you know, it's kind of like if you go back just a few years, I mean, the word sustainability, what does sustainability really mean in farming? <laughs> Um, is it, but that regenerative agriculture is the new sustainable farming and, um, right. you know, but it's a great thing. And, um, yeah, yes, yeah, Stephen. So this is, this is something that I've come across a lot recently in the few years, the amount of people using the word regenerative, but without having any idea what they mean by it, it's become kind of a buzzword. People who want to start farming, who have an interest in farming will often say regenerative agriculture, but that doesn't mean anything in and of itself. It's part of a plan, right? If you have, you know, an acre or a hundred acres and you want to do regenerative agriculture, well, that what are you trying to grow, right? Are you trying to grow regeneratively using uh, fruit trees? Are you using, you know, like I'm trying to do hazels? Are people trying to rotate animals with uh, other annuals? Like there are so many, it could mean so many different things that on its own, the word regenerative is fairly meaningless. It has to be part of a plan, right? If you have a farm plan, you can say, I wanna accomplish these goals and I'm going to try to attain those goals with these regenerative practices. That's fine, right? But simply saying regenerative agriculture doesn't actually like mean a whole lot. And I think it gets lost. You know, people use the okay. word, but without anything like any specific plan behind it, it definitely gets lost. Um, oh, right. I, I, understand, I, sorry, go ahead. I understand what you're saying. I don't know. I'd be curious uh, if you'd like to look back in the Tompkins Weekly archives and find our two articles. Uh, one of the things that we did was we, when we interviewed our, um, the different farmers, we pointed out the, the, the different ways in which they were using a kind of regenerative approach, very specifically. And actually, um, we, we, we approached you, I believe, about being one of the people that we wanted to interview. <laughs> and so maybe we, need to, maybe we need to come up with a new article where, where we just focus on you or, or Kristen. I mean, we would love to, to you know, introduce you to the world and, and to show your very specific take on what you're doing and, and addressing just the, the very thing that you just addressed. I think that would be really useful. I mean, yeah, and I certainly wasn't, I wasn't calling out any individual people, I guess more of as like, as a whole, I'm seeing right. that word regenerative just show up everywhere. It's the new sustainable, right? It's oh. something that shows up in all these books and all these articles. And it's just so, we're so inundated with it that I feel like it's starting to lose some meaning. But the, right. the other thing I wanted to bring up was something John had said earlier about like the, the food kitchen idea. I feel like for those of us who want to actually be able to make an income, right? Because currently when I look at how much money I'm going to make, even with value added goods, right? Selling oil as opposed to just raw hazelnuts, there's the amount of you know dollars per acre that you can make as a farmer is um, challenging to raise a family on, right? Like I might be able to retire on what I'm doing when my kids are all grown up. And I, once I paid off my mortgage and I paid off the tractor and all that, um, but, but I think value added is where it's, where it's at. And having some sort of cooperative or community space for turning your hot peppers into hot sauce, right? Mm -hmm. If you have sheep and you're, you're getting wool, right? Raw wool is fairly useless, right? But if you have a cooperative you know, fiber processing center, you can turn that into a product that someone will actually buy. I think those things are very, very important in agricultural communities, having these cooperative processing centers so that farmers can take something that's only worth, you know, a dollar a pound or whatever raw and unprocessed and turn it into something that's worth four or $5 a pound, right? Instead of having to give all that profit to other corporations, we 
the, the workers, the laborers, the growers, the owners, we can capture most of that profit instead of it going elsewhere. I feel like that's incredibly important. And so, Stephen is in the community then too. It doesn't, it isn't going off to St. Louis. Right. Exactly. And, and, and that's really Lizzie. key, Cal. Because um, what I wanted to bring up was that look at organic. So let's bring up organic. What <laughs> happens when organic becomes the buzzword? Money starts flowing in. And what's that mean? Large corporations. Well, you got 5,000 awesome. organic farms now. It's right. That so, right. So they get on the National Organic Standards Board. And all of a sudden you see the chain, the definition, the national definition of organic farming change. And yep. again, part of the Walmarting of America. It drives yep. me absolutely insane. Yep. And you'll probably see the same thing happen with this. So I, Lizzie, I, I don't, Lizzie, ahead, Lizzie yeah. your, your thing on, uh, but next Wednesday, I think is the Tompkins County Farm Bureau annual meeting where they do something called policy development. Next Thursday. Yeah. Next Thursday. Yeah. Okay. But, but if that's something that I think Lizzie, that if you could get, uh, that proposed, I, I think it's right. Am I, am I think? Are you, you, know, are, 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 you are you, are you talking to me, Cal? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My nickname is Lizzie. So that's, that's why, um, but I, I generally don't like to just automatically have people call okay. me that anyway. So Cal knows me as Lizzie. What, um, what are you saying that, that Farm Bureau has its annual pop, the local Tompkins County chapter has its local policy development annual meeting next Thursday, okay. which Lindsay will be part of. Okay. You know, this is the sort of thing that they like to hear, uh, you know, that, that's policies that then get taken to the, the state level and hopefully get plopped on Kathy Hochul's desk. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll and see. Just because they, they, they've got the infrastructure for doing, you know, there's a new buzzword too, infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> So you, but, you can you know. feed ideas through Cal to me, and we might be able to get some resolutions introduced next week that will go to the state delegates. Um, and maybe we can try to, you know, lobby, lobby next year on some of your ideas, you know. Um, but that's, that's how our process works. You know, Cal's okay. been a longtime member. And uh, if you want to funnel some ideas through him, you're more than welcome. Okay. Let, uh, how about you and I talk, Cal? Cal, yep. Okay. Yep. So sometime I, I would, over, the, over the weekend. Okay. Uh, Lisa, I would like to talk to you about that too, because I think there is a natural meeting place between uh, the concepts of regenerative agriculture, which is really speaking to the microbes in the soil and it's biological and it's taking the ec ecology of farming and putting it within the earth's ecology. So it is uh, a lot different, really, than um, uh, sustainable agriculture. It's in, in, it takes the newest ideas in biology, in the, bio, in the soil microbiome, and um, starts applying it to farming. And I don't know if it could scale up, it, but um, you should come to the November 18th uh, presentation because there's going to be some people there that do know more than just the superficial level of uh, the methods. I mean, most people are concerned with the methods and I've noticed that the state is, at, and Cooperative Extension too, are just really approaching people to use the methods because the biology and the really the understanding of what it is, is uh, not something that a lot of people are interested in. Mm -hmm. but now what November 18th meeting is this? It's, it's the second in the series. Oh, I see, okay. And, um, but I, I do, I would like to talk to you about it. So Elizabeth, right. I, I see that Joel Gagnon's uh, hand has been raised for a while. Oh, I'm sorry, Joel. I don't even see raised hand. Joel, talk. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the part of the discussion here that touched on, on the solar, uh, I, I think deserves 
further uh, commentary and exploration. The, the you know, the, you, you were you were talking, Lindsay, about how you know the landscape has changed so much in the last hundred years, and how it's, just, it's a small fraction of the land that's being used for agriculture now compared to what it was then. Uh, but but the main reason for that is the shift from from dairying to to other things because the we don't need near as much land to grow you know vegetables and fruits and even and even meat animals as we do to to to, to support dairies. Um, and and the and the land in the southern part of the county is not very well suited with with, with some exceptions. It's not very well suited to to growing row crops. You know we're we're we're, we're hilly. The land is is uh, poorly drained by and large, um, and um, and it it, it 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 does support grazing. Uh, and, and when the when the uh, when the landscape changes and, and and makes grazing a more profitable enterprise, then then you know we might see a resurgence of agriculture in this in this area. And we had it. And when when the price of oil went up to about hundred dollars a barrel, um, all of a sudden it become economic to 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 do feedlot culture. Uh, and uh, and it made more sense to do grazing animals and, and market them that way than than and there was a there was a boom, rather, rather brief boom. It was undercut by the development of fracking, which lowered the you know it undercut the price of oil and, and it and it and it um, set us back by a good solid ten years I think. But um, to to the point of, of solar, I don't really see an incompatibility between grazing and solar development. And, uh, you know, particularly if we if we modify the arrays so that they're not quite so tight to the ground, you know, if you raise them up a little bit, then you know they, we can we can we can graze sheep under those things. And when it makes sense to 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 grow sheep and use sheep, then 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 there'll be a, there'll be a demand for doing it. You know, I mean, but, but um, and 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 the good thing about solar is that it's not a once and done thing. It's not the same thing as putting in a housing development where the land is permanently converted from agricultural use. Except for somebody's backyard garden, you know, uh, the, the the solar arrays might be there for 30, 40, 50, or even 80 years, and and there's you know, you, you, and you unscrew the helical piers and cart them away, and you still got the land undeveloped. You know, why not? Um, and the why not for us is because Danby doesn't have the transmission lines. Right. You know, instead of instead of putting it here in Danby where it makes sense, you know, we're having it in, in Lansing and in Dryden where the best agricultural soils in the county are. You know. To me, that doesn't make any sense, but it's happening there because the transmission lines are nearby. Yep. So we need we need um, we need state policy really that would that will put the transmission lines into the places where it makes the most sense to have the solar farms located. And we need so people to eat more lamb. So the so the so yes. two things is you actually have two farmers in Tompkins County that do lease lease their, their sheep out to That's graze under solar panels. Actually, three things. Uh, there will be new Farm Bureau policy about the transmission line thing. And the third thing is, what the heck was the third thing? Oh my God, I got too much stuff on my mind. Um, bum, 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 and I don't know, I'll think of it, but um, no, you're very good points. And uh, again, again, you gotta remember what's driving the solar thing. The solar thing, you can say it's being driven by we all love the God green earth and we want it to live forever. It ain't being driven by that. It's being driven by federal tax subsidies and the state mandate on solar, the man state mandate on, um, on renewable energy. That's what's driving the solar thing. New York is not the greatest place to have solar, but the state has mandated it and there's a great federal tax subsidy on, uh, on solar. So, Anybody who thinks it's being done because we all love God's green earth is is silly. I mean, we all think it's great because it's for God's green earth. The politicians and the people that are making it happen have none to do with it. So the, the, there's the reality there. Again, I get invited to meetings to be the wet blanket. So I'm being the wet blanket. So. Well, we, we, Lindsay, we still, this is where the populations are though. And if we, generated all in Arizona and New Mexico, we got a hell of a distance to move it. And, and right on Cal, I agreed with that, great point. But yeah, I mean, it's not, I mean, I think here in Ithaca, we have 52 sunny days a year, <laughs> whatever the definition of sunny day is, but I know we've got a 10 kilowatt system on our house and we generate an average of 27 kilowatts a day over the last 12 years. 
interesting. And some days in February, we don't generate 100 watts. But over, over 12 years, we've generated an average of 27 kilowatts a day. So whatever. And it's probably the same for the big solar farms, you know. It's not, it's really not very efficient. Nope. But it's, but it's something. It, it's complicated. It's complicated yeah. by the fact that we have a crisis on our planet. But anyway, I'm going to have to draw this, this whole very interesting um, talk to a close. It's after nine. So thank you. And any ending questions or something that somebody wants to get out there before we leave? This? I'm thankful for making the acquaintances of many of our guests. Thank <laughs> you. This has been a pleasure. And it really has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Betsy. I'm Take glad care. that this is on. Thank you. I'm Bye -bye. glad it's recorded. Share it. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to save the recording. Yeah. I don't know how it stops. Right. I guess Janice. I don't like to do that. <laughs> Joel, does it stop automatically, the recording? It does. It stop yeah. when I can like, end the meeting. Pause it if you'd like. Uh, and then, of course, it will be recorded. The host needs to stop it. Yeah.